welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. I'm Rachel Breitster and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluations at the close of today's program. Continuing education credits are available after you complete our short post-test and your feedback is helpful in the planning of future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best meet your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. Our toll-free number is 1-800-452-0662. You can also email us at any time throughout the hour at phlive.ny at gmail.com. Today's program is Mental Health and Substance Abuse, Connecting the Dots. Our guests are Dr. Gerald Fishman, a licensed psychologist and university professor with a background in public health, and Raymond Bazzari, who has been an active public health practitioner and serves currently as Cayuga County's Director of Community Services and the Interim Director of Community Cayuga County Health and Human Services. Thank you both very much for being here. Now, before we begin, I would just like to point out to our audience that on slide nine, we have a list of acronyms and terms that our viewers will see before throughout the show. So that you can follow along with the discussion, please feel free to reference that slide. So thank you both so much for being here. We're really excited to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dr. Fishman, in addition to the, to the acronyms and terms that are on that slide that I referenced, there are some other terms that we want to make sure our audience is familiar with. So can you start by talking about some of those terms for our audience today? Yeah, we talk about co-occurring disorders, and co-occurring disorders generally refers to the presence of more than one mental health disorder. Substance abuse disorders are included here. So for COD, we're really referring to co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, other terms that are often used, MICA, some people may be familiar with, mentally ill, chemically addicted folks, MISA, mentally ill, substance abuse folks, and then there's a term that they refer to as comorbidity. Mm -hmm. And comorbidity really refers to the presence of more than one disease in an individual that has to be addressed. Comorbid conditions, uh, with respect to today's presentation, really have to do with the presence of mental health and substance use issues that make treatment complicated. Sure. And is there data that can help us understand the prevalence and incidence of co-occurring disorders or comorbidities in the United States? Uh, there's the uh, National Comorbidity Survey, mm -hmm. and uh, essentially it was done in 2012, our uh, more recent data, and they say approximately half of our uh, U.S. inhabitants will meet criteria for a diagnostic and statistical manual disorder. Now, anecdotally in the field, we say that 60 to 80 percent of clients coming in to substance use treatment have co-occurring mental health disorders. We find with uh, 50 to 60 percent of folks entering mental health treatment, they have co-occurring substance use disorders. So as a result, there's a critical need for us to be addressing both. Uh, substance use disorders generally occur uh, in a mental health population much more prevalently than they would in a general population as well. Sure. And are there estimations as to how many people in the United States might be living? I mean, certainly we see there's high percentages, but what does that actual raw number look like? Well, if you look at SAMHSA data, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, they talk about 8.9 million people having both a mental health and a substance use disorder. What we find as well is that over 80% of folks that are diagnosed with mental illness generally have some form of substance abuse or dependence issues that are contributing to the mental health symptoms that are emerging. Wow, that's a pretty significant number. So certainly the statistics that you've just shared with us demonstrate we've got a high percentage of folks and that certainly folks with substance abuse are often co-occurring with mental health. Can you talk to us about some of the general characteristics of what that population looks like? Well, what we find in the research as well as field-based practice is that there's a genetic component mm -hmm. that increases vulnerability to both mental health and substance use disorders in uh, most of our clients. Uh, that really reflects how the brain is going to work with stress and it's going to influence uh, predisposition to acquire uh, drug use and progress more rapidly to addiction. Uh, similarly, we do find that co-occurring disorders occur across the lifespan. 
uh, for all individuals uh, that we see, mental health and substance use. Uh, and as a result, we're uh, seeing evidence consequences across functional areas, housing, employment, uh, more often involvement with the law and uh, the legal system in general. And then unfortunately, we have high periods of relapse or repeat cycles through right. treatment. It's a very uh, difficult uh, condition to address uh, in terms of sustainability of mm -hmm. outcomes. And what about some of the behavioral characteristics of the population? Uh, both uh, for mental health and substance use or co-occurring disorder clients, we find cognitive impairments are demonstrated, uh, difficulties with encoding, comprehension, processing, and storage. Uh, it affects executive functions, so they have difficulty in planning, decision making, control of emotions and impulses, and a disorganized approach to working with stress and general life situations uh, can result in, unfortunately, making poor decisions and often uh, using alcohol and drugs as a way to cope. Thank you. So, Ray, the data clearly shows that we've got a, a problem on our hands. There's a very high percentage of people who are affected by this. You work in Cayuga County. Can you tell us about what specific events started turning up, started occurring in your county that indicated to you, we've got a situation that we really need to address. So we have a drug and alcohol subcommittee, which is a subcommittee of the Community Services Board, and it's chaired by the undersheriff, Jim Stoll. And we started you know, getting reports around, so a lot of uh, people were presenting at the emergency room with, with alcohol poisoning. It started this way, so we started hearing about those caffeinated alcohol drinks, and that sort of got people talking and thinking a little bit more about sort of the increased risk that people were, were, sort, were, sort, were, were sort of impacting their lives. And then, and then the synthetic marijuana thing, it, it really did blow up on, in our community, just like it did in communities all across the state. So we started hearing from emergency medical technicians and cops who were on the road responding to, you know, calls and people were very violent and they were behaving very strangely and, and they didn't really know what to make of that. So they, so, you know, the, we just started having conversations around the things that people were seeing and there was an awful lot of concern and worry on the part of people. They didn't know what to do, they didn't know how to handle this, so they were looking you know, for help, for guidance and advice. And so that conversation ended up just taking us to a bunch of places and, and we got very concerned you, you know, like if you, it, it, we have a lot of folks in treatment, you know what I mean? And then, you, you know, there's urine tests and you know, try to make sure that people have fidelity to their treatment and things like that. And people were behaving so erratically, but there's, the tests weren't showing anything. Emergency room presentations, people weren't, doctors didn't know what, were, what was in people's bloodstreams or in urines. They didn't know what to do with it. You know, we tried to stay ahead of that with testing. That didn't work very well. So, so out of those conversations came some, some pretty good ideas about stuff that we could do. I think it was a little overwhelming in the beginning, but sure. we started putting one foot in front of the other and we got some stuff done, so. Great, and I look forward to hearing about some of those things as we move through today's show. Now, so all of the evidence points to the fact that we need to implement some sort of intervention. Um, but with this population, there's going to be certain barriers to doing an effective intervention. Can you talk about what some of those barriers um, to individuals might be? Unfortunately, there's still a substantial amount of stigma yes. attached with entering treatment for mental health or substance use disorders. Absolutely. And as a result, people who are suffering are more likely to use services when in crisis, mm -hmm. more likely to go into emergency <laughs> departments versus accessing more traditional services, uh, and they tend to be less engaged in treatment. Uh, COD clients uh, also have a decreased likelihood of complying with treatment recommendations and follow through. And what is particularly critical for us in the field is that uh, with COD, there tends to be a more rapid progression from what starts out as recreational use becomes abuse, becomes dependence. Mm -hmm. And there's that vulnerability to more rapidly progress to addiction and a reliance on the drug uh, than in folks in the general population. Interesting. So Raymond, in your work at the county level, what are some of the individual circumstances that you've seen that people face that makes it hard for them to access treatment? There's a number of things that make it really difficult for people. I mean, in, in, insurance coverage is, is, is a big one. You know, they're not going to pay for treatment. They have really interesting rules around denying mm -hmm. people. And, 
and the providers who have the experience in sort of determining people's levels of care continually arguing with insurance companies and while that's happening people are continuing to use or continuing to experience the symptoms that that, that get them get them get them jammed up it's a lot of social and family issues I mean the the, the stigma thing that Jerry talks about is, is is huge for individuals I mean we really we, we say these things are diseases but we don't really sort of behave that way nor do we treat people that way we sort of marginalize them and tend tend to blame them a lot of homelessness people who are homeless aren't able to keep their appointments they're not able to sort of take care of themselves this makes things worse unemployment interrupted treatment they get bounced back and forth between the systems because they're not able to manage their symptoms or or their life well enough to be able to get to places and things like that those are some of the things that keep people from really being able to sort of connect and follow through and then get on a course towards recovery and what about some of the systemic barriers? So certainly as an individual, you know, facing homelessness, I would imagine, is a huge barrier. But what about some of the system level um, barriers? And you referenced some of them, but are there others you want to discuss? You know, there's long wait lists. I mean, I think you also you have, you, have, you have a bias in the system around how we're going to take care of these people. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the practitioners have, have sort of, you know, rules that, that people aren't able to keep. It, it gets them kicked out of treatment. You know, they and, and, and the, the, the people who do the referring, so you present in different places, they send you places where they think that you're going to get help and you, and you don't. So there isn't really any organization in the system always good enough to sort of get folks to where they need to be. They end up losing their benefits when they're not able to stay in treatment. So it just becomes a cycle for people. I mean, the system, I think, does a really good job of making it difficult for people to get help. So I think one of the things that we would agree on is that we need some sort of integrated care. Um, but certainly we're seeing substance use disorders and mental illnesses occur together. Are there specific combinations that tend to occur? And, and can you start by talking about some of the specific mental illnesses we see, such as anxiety disorder and some of the combinations that tend to occur? Yeah, uh, what we're finding is reliably there are certain drugs of choice that are used by folks with particular differential diagnoses. So for example, with anxiety disorders, uh, the epidemiological catchment area study, the national comorbidity surveys, they indicate that there's two times to four times the risk of an alcohol use disorder in individuals with anxiety. Uh, interestingly, we also find stimulant use is uh, much greater in individuals who have anxiety as well as post-traumatic stress disorder, and that includes the veteran population, uh, which about 75% with vets uh, are going to meet criteria for substance use disorder. Uh, anxiety folks tend to find that alcohol can be a sedating agent, but it uh, at times leaves them vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And out of fear of being hurt, they often will select stimulants as a way to remain on hyper alert sure. uh, to be capable of a quick startle and response if there is any jeopardy. Uh, we do find uh, that more than 70% actually of clients coming into treatment have trauma backgrounds. So it's becoming very important for us to inquire about trauma as well. Absolutely. And what about some of the drug preferences or the co-occurring disorders with schizophrenia? Uh, with schizophrenics, we find that over a third have alcohol use disorders, uh, 75 to 90 percent are nicotine <laughs> dependent. Uh, it's interesting, nicotine serves as both a sedative and a stimulant in terms of its pharmacologic activity and uh, it actually works with a neurotransmitter in the brain called dopamine which is responsible for hallucinatory activity and delusional activity. So uh, we're finding that nicotine actually will reduce uh, some of this psychotic phenomena in clients. Uh, we also find that alcohol, cocaine, and cannabis are substances that are frequently used uh, in many cases due to uh, price. Interesting. And what about bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder tends to be uh, the principal mental health di disorder that's associated with substance use. 56% uh, of any bipolar diagnostic uh, client uh, tends to have a lifetime prevalence of substance use disorders. Uh, odds ratios for, say, 12-month alcohol use disorders and drug use disorders uh, quite high uh, compared to the uh, general population, uh, as high as 8.3 times respectively. 
And uh, we do find that the most common substances that are selected by bipolar patients tend to be alcohol, cocaine, and cannabis. Uh, folks with bipolar who swing between uh, moods uh, do not generally select opiates as a drug of choice because that tends to have a CNS depressant effect. And can you finally tell us about depression? Uh, depression uh, tends to be associated with alcohol and opiates. Okay. Uh, they tend to allow an individual to dissociate from the uh, negative affect and depressed mood. Uh, we do find a lifetime prevalence of co-occurring alcohol use disorders and drug use disorders for those people with major depressive disorder. It tends to be approximately 18%. Uh, so they're vulnerable as a population, and we find that the use of alcohol and opiates paradoxically will worsen the depression. And what about lifetime prevalence for those with depression and, and certain substances they might be engaged with? Well, when we talk about alcohol prevalence, we're really looking at 40 to 67 percent of the clients with a diagnosis of major depressive disorder are likely across studies to show uh, vulnerability to substance use disorder. Uh, cocaine dependence, about 30 to 40 percent of clients may get involved with that. And opioid dependence, as I've mentioned, uh, is becoming increasingly popular as well, as high as 64 percent of about two-thirds of those people with a diagnosis of depression, uh, they're likely to be utilizing that substance. Thank you very much for those statistics. Now, certainly throughout New York State, various counties have seen increases in substance abuse as a result of these comorbidities. Let's take a look at a dynamic public health intervention implemented in Erie County, New York, that is working to reduce morbidity from substance use disorders and overdoses. My name's Cheryl Moore. I'm a medical care administrator with the Erie County Health Department. In Erie County, we've been seeing an incredible overdose increase in the past three years, especially with opiates. The prescription drug problem led us to this, and now with the iStop law in place, there's less access to prescription drug, and our heroin overdoses are increasing dramatically. In the past year, we've seen an 85% increase in heroin overdoses alone. And historically, we thought of like you saw in the movies, the person in the dark alley behind the dumpster and they were shooting up drugs. That's not what we're seeing today. The opiate overdoses come from pharmaceutical venues as well as from heroin utilization. We had a huge, huge opiate pharmaceutical problem, which we've worked through law, through the iStop law, to address. What we're seeing now are the repercussions. People that entered the system through legal means, this was a disease of means. It was a disease of affluence, a disease of people with health insurance they don't have access anymore. They're still, it's a disease, folks. They're sick. They're seeking to feel like you and I do every day, and this is what they're doing. So our population is now very much suburban. It's young. It's generally white. It's not what we saw in the past. In the past, it was older. It was folks who had been in the system for many years, low socioeconomic, generally of a, one of the ethnicities that had a small pop minority population. It's not who we see anymore. It's your next door neighbor. Narcan is an opiate antagonist. How it works is it gets in there and it blocks the space where an opiate would be. It kicks it out actually and blocks the spot for 20 minutes to about an hour and a half and does not allow the opiate to work at all. Narcan's administered to someone experiencing an opiate overdose. By administering it to them, you throw them into complete withdrawal. Initially when we started this program, um, working with law enforcement was a new way of administering this program. This had historically been first responders being EMS, and there were some lines there that we had to look at that were being crossed. Um, we had to look at the piece that EMS is the medical providers. Law enforcement are law enforcement. But under the Good Samaritan law, people respond with AEDs, with CPR. It's do no harm, it's just try to help someone. This falls under the same law. We had to address this and teach people that whoever's there first, give someone the option to live and to touch the system. We've tried to be as open as possible to keep lines of communication open. We hosted a heroin summit a few months back. We brought all different venues of law enforcement, prevention providers, treatment providers, public health, everybody together in the same room to learn about the problem in our community and how we should respond to it. Work groups were created there. Work groups actually came out with this and said, Narcon needs to happen. And we work closely with our local syringe exchange program, Evergreen Health Services. All clients there are offered Narcon training. They're offered a consumer kit. Um, they were, the point is 
they're the ones closest to the scene. If you are using or you're a family member or you're a friend, you're the first one that's going to be there. The other agency in our community is Horizon Health Services. It is really focusing on educating consumers and getting the kits in their hands and that of their loved ones and their acquaintances. Our program is geared much differently. It is geared at the law enforcement community and first responder community to get the broadest access. One of the things that we reiterate in our training over and over when we train our officers and first responders is this is the only touch many of these people will have with the system. To get them linked to services, this is a chance. Addiction is a disease. It's not a choice. They lost the choice. The only choice was the first time they used drugs. Now it's become a disease. So in order to link people with the system when they don't think they need help, this is a chance. So Erie County appears to have been doing some really innovative work around harm reduction, and I understand that Cayuga County has as well. So I'm wondering if you can tell us some of the specific elements of your county's plan um, to address this issue. So, you, you know, when we, we had talked earlier about how we started having this community discussion about, about what we were seeing, and, and, and that was very sobering for people, and, and it, it led us to to sort of think about the sort of things that we can do. I think initially people were pretty overwhelmed, you know, mm -hmm. what are we gonna do? This is such a big problem, we're not gonna be able to, to, to do anything about it. So we just started started breaking it down and we, we do have some resources, so we, we're sort of figuring out what we're gonna do. So we, we talked about Narcan, we talked about, you know, we talk about housing first, we talk about those kinds of things. Um, we, we started having a lot of public discussions, forums, where we would have d different people coming in and having a conversation about what they're seeing and what they're talking about, much like this, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and this engaged other people in the community. And we started talking about prevention, because that's a fairly easy, low-hanging fruit kind of thing to do. We got information out to school districts. They were, they were great. They sent stuff home with their students. Right. We, we talked to pharmacists. We talked to physicians about best practice prescribing. We, we talked about this kind of CMEs that you could that you could that you could sort of enroll in that would help you sort of figure this out. We we we, we approached it as like you know, there's, a, there's a lot of public health elements to this, which is really different for us. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, to sort of look at a problem like this, and um, we did a bunch of other things like they, the district attorney, he passed a local law because the, the legislature is sort of struggling with the synthetic drug thing. So we passed a local law that allowed us close head shops sort of strangle the supply of that. But then when we did that, then, you know, I think the eye stop that you hear about and we started pushing people towards heroin and we started seeing different things. But the same plan works anyways. It just was a different focus. So those are the kinds of things that, that, that we did, you, you know, initially around what, what, what are some of the moves that we could do rather than just sit still and, and watch this happen in our community. And there's a lot of elements contained in your plan. So can you talk about where did you specifically focus your resources to try to achieve some of those goals? So, you know, so on the prevention side, we were able to sort of divert some, some funding and divert some energies to, to, to do that. But we wanted to do some really specific things around integration. You, you, you know, I think that when we looked at our system, we, we started to see some of, the, some of the holes in it when you started hearing about what's happening to individuals. Mm -hmm. So then we, we, you know, we made some state aid available to, to fund some evidence-based kind of trainings for, for police. So we done mental health first aid, we we're training our community. We're, we're going to train 30 trainers that can go out and over the course of time train hundreds of people so we can be a little bit smarter about how we respond to stuff. Uh, critical incident training for the, for the police agencies because in the EMTs because when they're out there in the community and they're handling this sort of stuff, they don't really know what they're sort of up against. Mm -hmm. We peeled some state aid off for a mobile crisis team. We were, we were having the police bring people into our clinic from an ER diversion sort of you know, you know, standpoint, but you know, after hours there wasn't a lot of help for them, so we're gonna be able to give them some sort of resources, sort of you know, do screenings in the field, sort of figure out what, what, what we're up against and, and sort of connect those folks to treatment, sort of resource that a little bit. Um, you know, uh, and then this delivery system reform initiative disrupt, I know Kelly was on the show and she, she, she talked about that, we have this, we do have this coming out of our ears. But one of the, what's nice about it is you're able to do some really good planning and you're able to get some resources. So like in our community, we're gonna, they're gonna build something next to the emergency room in the hospital. So you got sort of like, you, you come in the one door and you, and you get diverted to where you need to go. And, and in their primary care, half of it, they're gonna, we're gonna be launching behavioral health services, both substance abuse and mental health from there. 
and, and also, you know, physical health is integrated there, and then we're going to, you know, hopefully have some detox beds and some ability to really sort of um, figure out what people need and, and sort of make that connection. So those are the kind of things that, that we sort of did with, with the resources that we had at our disposal. Excellent. Thank you. Now, one of the ways, Jerry, to identify clients who may need treatment is using the CAGE or the CAGE aid. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how it's used? Brief screeners can be particularly helpful because mm -hmm. they're short instruments that have items that will red flag uh, someone who may be uh, in need of a higher level of care or treatment. So screeners such as the CAGE or the CAGE adapted for use with individuals with drugs uh, are essentially questionnaires that can give us a very quick look at whether or not an individual has uh, a potential problem with alcohol or drugs. So uh, they tend to include four items, the CAGE and the CAGE aid, and uh, essentially they're talking, uh, and the acronym CAGE refers to feeling a need to cut down as a concern. Have you ever uh, been annoyed by what others consider to be problematic for you? Uh, have you had guilt? or any type of shame or feelings about your drinking and drug use that get you to question your use. And then finally, looking at amount and frequency of consumption and saying, how does your day begin? You know, uh, are you using this essentially as a way to open your eyes and begin the day? Sure. And what about there's another assessment, the modified mini? Can you talk about who can administer that and once a person's been screened, how should they be directed? Uh, the modified mini screen was actually developed by uh, Oasis. And uh, essentially, it's a mental health screener that looks at three primary areas. It looks at mood disorders, it looks at anxiety, and that includes PTSD, and it also looks at psychotic process disorders. Uh, paraprofessionals as well as professionals can administer the modified mini. Uh, agencies tend to set cutoffs, uh, which would then lead to referring for a uh, more comprehensive evaluation. And what the modified mini really does is give you a sense of whether an individual's mental health could also be influencing their substance use patterns or made worse by substance use. And can you talk about some of the theoretical um, or the theories regarding mental health or substance abuse that professionals would want to consider uh, when, de when uh, thinking about treatment for an individual? Yeah, we talk about integrated treatment, as Ray's been mentioning, and when we talk about integration, we really have to look at models that would explain the co-occurrence of both mental health and substance use disorders. So uh, one model, called the common factor model, argues that there's a genetic vulnerability that is present that would trigger one or both disorders. It also talks about commonality of environments that may elicit symptoms of both disorders. Uh, a secondary substance use disorder model really reflects those folks who are self-medicating in order to cope with mental health symptoms and stress. And these are individuals that got into alcohol and drug use as a way essentially to control and stabilize their mental health and it led to adverse outcomes. Uh, the super sensitivity model is particularly important for folks to be aware of, particularly the medical folks, because what it's found in the research is that individuals with mental health disorders tend to have a heightened effect of alcohol and drugs so that it's a quicker effect, it's a more intensified effect which leads to more addictive potential uh, and can actually worsen the mental health symptoms being presented. Uh, the secondary psychopathology model argues that it's the substance use that triggered the mental health symptom emergence or re-emergence. So another reason to be asking critical questions about both disorders. Uh, and that leads to what we consider bi-directionality, which is at some point, etiology isn't really the issue. Uh, it's more about the fact that both are integratively affecting uh, the individual. Sure. And can you talk about some of the challenges or successes regarding these different treatment models? The treatment models used in the field, there's been an evolution in thought. And what started out as a sequential model, which said if you come in for a mental health problem 
and you have substance use issues, we're going to stabilize your mental health first before we address the substance use. If you came into a substance abuse treatment facility, we would need to stabilize you in recovery in order for us then to begin working with mental health. And they found that that was leading to very poor outcomes, mm -hmm. high degree of relapse. Uh, they again began to look at parallel models, which argued that we'll treat both simultaneously but in different settings. So that, that disconnect between treatment approaches and modalities, and particularly at different settings, was again leading to poor outcomes, which led SAMHSA and many of the federal agencies to begin to look at more integrated treatment models, which mean under the same roof, mm -hmm. individuals are getting services that address both coping skills and relapse prevention, and within each group talking about what can we do to essentially soothe ourselves and cope in ways that are more effective to avoid worsening our mental health or to return to active alcohol and drug use. Right. And it's those integrated models that are getting a lot of uh, research support. Excellent. And so that seems to be one of the themes today, right? It's talking about integration, integration, integration. So Raymond, in Cayuga County, can you talk about the different elements that were adopted to try to coordinate um, and integrate the identification, the treatment um, for individuals with co-occurring disorders? Sure. Um, we're a long way away from integrated treatment, you know, and, but that doesn't mean that we can't start at certain places. So we have a, you know, our role is to plan and to allocate resources and to sort of create a system that effectively meets people's needs. So some of the things that we could do early, you know, on with, with, with the planning was, so we universally adopt the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, right? We have a lot of kids and adults being brought to the emergency room with people presenting not getting all sorts of sort of crazy things happening in the community, really not knowing who's who's at risk, really what, what, what that is. So, you know, we contract with a lot of providers and we do a lot of things for people, so we're able to use that leverage to get them to commit to. This is an evidence-based, you, you, you know, SAMHSA recommended tool that you can, that, that you can use to sort of gauge where, where people are. And then you can create a system of what to do with them afterwards. Do, do they need safety planning? Do you need to contact parents? You can really wrap, wrap yourself around taking care of people. So we, we made sure that all the agencies and a lot of the school districts were, were using this as a, as, a, as a way to sort of empirically kind of figure out where, where the individual was at rather than responding to some sort of, you know, feeling about risk. Um, we, we're doing a lot of cross training with the mental health and substance abuse providers and, and, and law enforcement people because you know this business about you know you know these silos that we're in and, and that this you have to go you have to be in this treatment for a little while before you can go here it, is, it isn't really working and the research and Jerry talked about it, the research really shows that it doesn't work so we're really trying to give people the idea you know the idea that um, there's a different way and there's a better way and, and and we can sort of you know go down this road together and I think there's some excitement about that. Although there's a lot of regulatory and, and payment, a lot of issues sort of prevent that. We have a lot of clinics in schools, you know, so and we have, um, we have open door access at our clinics, so a lot of people are moving through them. Um, we sort of, uh, you know, asked people and, and, and they were agreeable to do the screenings. You know, again, there's evidence based. So we're screening a lot of kids in schools. Be before they present with some sort of issue, you're sort of doing, you're doing screening, sort of or do some early identification so you can get kids connected earlier before they you know, get, get, get more ill, you, you know, and then we are screening in primary care doctor's offices because you, a lot of people who, who are struggling with substance abuse or mental health issues really are getting most of their care from primary care doctors. So we, we're putting practitioners in those, in those practices, doing some screenings, connecting people, because there is that stigma thing that, that we sort of mention. People will go to their primary care doctor, but they may not want to sit in a clinic, so we sort of want to deliver the, deliver the services to, to, to them. So those are some of the things that, that we think we can do. You know, the OASIS clinic screening for, for, for mental illness, mm -hmm. the, the mental health clinic screening for substance abuse, and there's doing a little bit of work with that. So we want to get to the next step, so. Great. Uh, now, once individuals are screened and get into treatment, oftentimes medication is used to manage co-occurring disorders. Can you talk, Dr. Fishman, about uh, the different medications that might be used and how they're incorporated into treatment plans? Yeah, there's increased use of pharmacotherapy as an adjunct to traditional treatment uh, to assist folks with mental health and substance use uh, recovery. So with anxiety, for example, they've found a medication called Boost Bar uh, has had a favorable effect not only in addressing the anxiety symptomatology, but also uh, reducing alcohol consumption rates. 
they use SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, to look at addressing both anxiety and depressed mood. And they've found that it reduces cocaine and opioid consumption patterns and rates. Uh, benzos, uh, such as Xanax, Klonopin, Valium, are discouraged because that uh, will generally trigger relapse with alcohol and other sedative agents. And are there specific drugs that are often used with depression? Uh, again, the antidepressants, such as the SSRIs, uh, have been found to reduce cocaine and opiate use. Uh, they don't appreciably reduce alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, with bipolar disorders, we do find now a category of meds, uh, the anticonvulsants, uh, the Neurontin, the Depakote, uh, and even lithium has been found to decrease substance use rates, uh, including alcohol use. And what about with schizophrenia? Uh, with schizophrenia, a uh, drug that is uh, first generation but continues to get used is clozapine. Uh, it decreases psychotic symptomatology, and it's also been found to increase abstinence rates from substance use, uh, which includes uh, increasing uh, reduction in nicotine and cocaine. Uh, Risperdal has uh, become uh, more recently uh, prescribed. Uh, it tends to stabilize dopamine levels, uh, which will also stabilize psychotic process, but it has been found, interestingly, uh, to reduce alcohol cravings, and it's beginning to be used as an alcohol-specific med as well. And there are specific medicines that folks might hear about, Suboxone, uh, those sorts of things. Can you talk about those? Uh, suboxone uh, is used uh, primarily with opiate-dependent individuals, and it's been found as a maintenance medication uh, to produce what we call harm reduction, mm -hmm. uh, getting involved not only with drug use but other uh, risky behaviors. Uh, suboxone tends to be uh, a reduced term of uh, maintenance compared to what uh, methadone has, and the intent is uh, two to five years on suboxone, and hopefully someone will be weaned off. Uh, they have meds that specifically address alcohol. For example, Campril has been found to be very helpful with uh, reducing alcohol cravings. Uh, there's now a stream of research that uses uh, Provigil, which uh, some people may know as Modafinil, and really that just refers to working with wakefulness and sleep disorders. And they're finding that uh, Provigil uh, is useful with reducing cocaine cravings as well. Uh, for nicotine-dependent individuals, uh, there is a mixed review on the continued use of Shantix mm -hmm. uh, for essentially occupying those nicotine receptors in the brain. Uh, it is prescribed, but it has to be monitored closely sure. uh, due to the fact that it can cause significant anxiety and some other uh, mood-based issues. Now, moving beyond the medication aspect of things, what are some strategies that are important in maintaining a successful therapeutic relationship? Well, you want to keep in mind that when you have co-occurring disorders, you want to match clients with an appropriate type and level of care. Mm -hmm. uh, we use ASAM criteria uh, to determine level of care and which is appropriate. And we really want to, with these clients, because there is stigma attached, uh, because they're very unfamiliar with integrated treatment, we want to use a very supportive and empathic uh, approach to working with them. Uh, when people relapse, we welcome them back. Yeah. And we say, what did you learn from that? Uh, we're really trying to be much more receptive uh, to maintaining a recovery perspective. And that recovery is for both mental health and substance use. And really we're talking about uh, helping an individual return to a higher level of functioning and a fuller quality of life in the community. Uh, we have to be careful as professionals, whether it's public health or practitioners in the field, uh, what we call countertransference, which is our own feelings and perceptions and thoughts that are projected onto a client mm -hmm. who continues to return to treatment uh, because co-occurring disorders tend to have, unfortunately, uh, high remission rates uh, for treatment. 
And we have to monitor psychiatric symptoms closely because they often will trigger a return to active use. Excellent, thank you so much. Now, as we saw before, Erie County has developed interventions to address substance abuse in their area. Now we're going to see a clip from Erie County on their school-based mental health program and how that's meeting clients right where they are. The Erie County School-Based Mental Health Program is a set of clinic satellite services located in the schools. When we started expanding into the schools, we used a satellite status for those clinics so they could be where the kids and families are and be able to provide treatment services in a natural environment. The circumstances that led us to integrate treatment services into a school setting was the arrival of Say Yes into the Buffalo Public Schools. Say Yes is a collaboration in the Buffalo Public Schools to bring support into the schools to help kids, number one, help kids graduate, and number two, if they graduate, to be able to support their college education. Say Yes came to the county departments to ask us to partner with them. We partnered with Say Yes Buffalo, the Buffalo Public Schools, the Erie County Department of Health, the Erie County Department of Mental Health, and the Erie County Department of Social Services. Later, the Community Foundation of Greater Buffalo entered that collaboration. This collaboration allowed us to move into schools in cooperation with the school system with a standard set of outcomes, a standard set of responsibilities, a standard set of accountability. So it's been really great. The clinic treatment programs in the schools is part of what they do, they provide treatment for individuals who have a dual diagnosis in their families. So as part of the assessment process, they'll identify when a child has behavioral health issues, when a child has both behavioral health and substance abuse issues. If they identify a child who needs more help than that, they will work to address those needs and get the child to the best program. Some of the benefits of being in the schools are really being where the kids and families are. Being in their natural environments, often there's a stigma to going to a mental health clinic. People don't want to be identified as having a mental health issue. This has helped us work better with the schools, to better coordinate services with the schools, to better be where the kids and families are so they don't have to go someplace else to get the services that they need. So Raymond, there are a number of resources and places where people can find more information because we only have a limited amount of time to talk about it during the show. So can you direct our viewers to where they can find more information on some of the work your county is doing? I think you go to the OASIS in, in the Office of Mental Health websites and you go to the SAMHSA websites. And I think if you, you know, there's a lot of research out there. There's a lot of success happening in a lot of different places. I think we just have to look for it. Mm -hmm. it's, stuff can be replicated. A lot of it's research-based, it's evidence. There's, there's, some, there's some track record of, of, of following outcomes. So I would, just, I would just have people direct them to those websites and, and, and there's an awful lot of um, advice and consultation available and that's what they should do. Great, thank you. And Dr. Fishman, another great resource is the SAMHSA kit for co-occurring disorders. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, SAMHSA's been involved for quite a while with developing training manuals and kits that will assist in uh, developing programs, implementing programs, and then actually doing some outcome assessment. Uh, the kit itself really goes through four stages of uh, programming. So you're talking about exploration of needs and then adoption of a program, implementation, and then outcome assessment. So it really talks about how to build the program. It talks about how to train staff who are working directly with clients. It talks about how do you evaluate your program. And the beauty of evidence-based kits is that they are promoting uh, research and standardized protocols. Excellent. Now, Raymond, we're coming to the end of the show. Can you share with us a review of some of the interventions in your county that you feel have been most successful and that others might want to emulate? I think it's really difficult to move providers. You, you know, like people, they, you know, they, they have a way of doing business. They have a way of behaving. It gets sort of institutionalized. They train their workforce when they come up. So you have to, you have to, you have to put some pressure on them. 
and you, and you have to do it in a way that they don't really sort of know it's pressure. So I, I think that for us it worked really well the way it happened, and it was accidental the way it happened, but I think the observation would be if you can, if you can start talking about this uh, as a public health problem, you know, and sort of try to change that sort of dialogue. When you take, you take a look at your population, take a look at things that you can do, early screenings, all that sort of stuff, which is fairly sort of stuff that people accept and does, don't feel very threatened by. And, and you bring, more, you bring more, more, more people involved in that conversation. And then it gets, when you have the providers in the room and you start talking about things like these people that you're kicking out of treatment are homeless and this is how it's impacting the community, this is how it's impacting the, I don't think that people necessarily know what happens with the consequences of their treatment decisions sometimes. I think it, it happens and then the person walks out the door and, and, and that's it. I don't think we're understanding what really is going on with the populations that we're, we're, we're trying to, to treat. So. I would suggest that you that you start that way, and that you bring sort of different kind of players to the table. Public health people who normally aren't at the table, but really have a seat. And I think that they're being we're being sort of asked to include them in our planning and things like that. And there's such a such a wealth of information there that they do around community outreach and education, and and, and it moves systems. So Office of Mental Health and Oasis should steal. There are some of those ideas from there, so I think that's really what what's worked for us. And then continue continue meeting and continuing, you know, gaining momentum and putting pressure on people. And then they they sort of come to the realization on their own, and they don't feel like they got shoved. I mean, people don't like to be shoved, and and I, so I think that's that's where I would start. Excellent, thank you so much. So we've got a few questions that have come in so far from our audience. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with. For those of us who don't know, can you explain harm reduction, why it's an important principle, and what resources exist for harm reduction in New York State? I would start right here. If, in, if you're in a community, so harm reduction is, you know, you, you know, so they give clean needles away, right? A lot mm -hmm. of people aren't going to do that. A lot of communities have an issue with that. Um, kicking people out of treatment, you know, give, get, you know, that's that's not harm reduction. That's actually sort of increasing the risk of harm. So Narcan is a tool, right? Because you're you're you're, you're preventing somebody from dying, but you're not really forcing them to engage in treatment. Housing first is a thing that's really important in a state. There's an awful lot of research that talks about how people do better when they're housed. You can't make housing contingent on treatment compliance. It's really not fair to the consumer, and it, it actually just sort of perpetuates that that sort of stuff. Some of the um, medications that Jerry was describing are, are harm reduction. I don't know if you want to talk about that some more. I mean, they're really very important in this. Well, as Ray's saying, you know, it's like a three-leg stool. So it, you really need to be talking about treatment, housing, and employment as a way to stabilize someone in recovery. And harm reduction really can be assistive uh, with medications that allows an individual to maintain functionality and be engaged in the community uh, while they're continuing to work on changing lifestyle, which is critical in order not to return to patterns of use or to be uh, vulnerable to risk factors. So harm reduction becomes particularly uh, helpful in that respect too. So not necessarily looking at, we're going to solve all of these problems right here, right now, and you're going to do it our way, but let's look at the situation and, and minimize the harm that's happening to this individual and support them in whatever ways we can. Yeah, the goal, of, the goal of abstinence at times is unrealistic. And that may uh, be contrary to what many people in the field argue and many people in recovery argue. Uh, but we do find that harm reduction can move an individual on the pathway to recovery. Excellent. Thank you. So I'd just like to give you an example of mm -hmm. like how, this, how this plays out in the, in the world. So we, we, we have a guy who goes through um, detox and inpatient for, for opiate, opiate abuse. And, and completes all of that and goes to live at a halfway house and gets caught with cough syrup and gets kicked out. So that doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Right, absolutely. Um, another question, are there current plans working toward an integrated mental health and substance abuse treatment program on a systems or policy level? So the Office of Mental Health and OASIS, have, have there, like there's, they, they have, um, been talking about and had have issued some guidance around you know integrated licensing models. The thing that really gets in the way on the ground for doing integrated care is the regulations and the payment methodology and the staffing patterns of the people that work in those particular facilities, whatever your licensing is, doesn't allow for you to do that. So they've, they've been talking about this for a while and there's a couple of, um, there's a few sort of demonstration sites 
most of the work has really been around sort of trying to massage the regulations to make it okay for people. So you're also talking DOH licensed places too, because you know primary care, federally qualified clinics, all of those places are, are doors that people walk through. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Um, so I think that there's there's some movement there. There's there not as much as we need, and there needs to be some sort of efforts on training the workforce. We have a workforce that doesn't know how to behave this way necessarily. Sure. Um, we have another question. Could you please speak to how the screening brief intervention and referral to treatment may assist with AOD and mental health integration? Yeah, the SBIRT uh, can be very helpful in that it has uh, a range of items that will cover both mental health and alcohol and or other drug use. Uh, it's a useful tool because it's quite clear uh, in terms of uh, interpreting scores and uh, moving toward uh, what ASAM criteria would argue is a need to look at what proper level of care would be uh, most effective for this client as well as their term of readiness for that level of treatment. Thank you. Um, I want to address that we have a number of comments coming in that folks were unable to read the resource kit. And just as a reminder, the handouts for today's webcast are available on our website. That's www.phlive.org. You can download the slides there, and they contain the written information for where you can find any of the resources that are being discussed today. Um, we have another question. Um, all right, this is. Your screening, you offer screenings in schools and for young people who are not diagnosed with a disorder but still may have levels of anxiety or depression or not yet showing symptoms, what do you do? So that's, that's what the screenings do is. So, you know, we, you, you, I think it, when it started out, we were screening in like um, third and, and fifth grade. So we were in the elementary schools and we were in the middle schools. So you, you, would, you, would, you would screen kids and then you would, you would, you would get it, you would, you, would, you would evaluate the screening tools and then you would, you would get some information about whether or not the kid was experiencing some of the, that sort of stuff. And then you would sit with the parents and you would have a conversation and you would say, look, this is what we did. You know, and they knew about it because they would sign consents and all of that sort of stuff. And, and so you would sit with the family and you would talk about that sort of stuff. So th the goal was to sort of raise their awareness and, 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 get, and, get, and get the kid sort of connected to, to, to early treatment because the earlier, the better. So that's kind of how it worked. You re work really closely with your clinics and your school districts and parents to sort of pull that together. And it, it's, it's a lot easier now, I think, than it, than it was then because it's more, it's more normalized a little bit to do those screenings. It works the same way in primary care physicians' offices, same, same, same type of idea. Yeah, these screenings can be very useful uh, from a behavioral health perspective in primary care settings uh, because it alerts uh, the physician or physician assistant or nurse uh, to be inquiring further and actually doing some education along the way uh, with the patient. Great. Um, another question, how does New York State or your community balance approaches to mental health promotion and disorder prevention with treatment and recovery approaches? That's a pretty good question. <laughs> I'm not sure that we approach it in organized in that manner, which I think is part of the challenge for us. We spend a lot of time putting fires out. Okay. Don't spend enough time on, on the early identification, the prevention, and all the sort of things that you would do to work the circle. So yeah, we, we have a long way to go there. I mm -hmm. wish I had a better answer. There's a disconnect. Uh, you know, we focus our efforts on screening and prevention and early intervention, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with the evidence-based treatment approaches that are gonna be used for recovery. So we still have some way to go in terms of uh, a fuller coordination and integration of how we identify with the approach we're going to utilize in treatment. All right. um, another question, is there truly an opiate epidemic in New York State and if so why is this such a problem now? It's a plague upon us. <laughs> This is, this is what this is. All the things that you talked about, or that the woman talked about from, from, from Erie County, mm -hmm. right? So you had, a, you had a prescription drug explosion. You know what I mean? People were getting um, opiates, adults, kids, sports injuries, all that sort of stuff. Some prescribers were a little loose. Folks were able to get these refills for a really long time. I stopped came along, 
a lot of attention got focused on this. I stop comes along. So when I talk to my psychiatrist, when they would go in and they would look in there, the things that they would see would freak them out. People getting, you know, 90 day supplies of, of, of huge doses of Oxycontin and stuff like that. People aren't able to get those anymore. So that, that, that disease, that addiction just didn't just disappear because you weren't able to get that script anymore. So you're gonna buy them on the street, $40 a pill, you need 12. All right, so can't afford that. So you can go, you can, heroin's very cheap, very potent, very expensive, or inexpensive. Um, you can snort it now, you don't have to shoot it. There, anybody who doesn't think that there's an opiate problem in New York State should sort of rethink that, I think. And that's happening regionally. You know, there's a similar epidemic in uh, Massachusetts and Vermont. They've had state summits on this issue. Uh, there's also a lot of diversion of medications. They end up on the streets. Uh, eventually folks switch to heroin because it's less expensive. Uh, the reason for so many overdoses is that you never can be sure about the purity of the heroin, heroin uh, that you're consuming. So heroin that may have been cut in one way can differ from another uh, batch that you got uh, to consume and that can lead to overdose. And more folks uh, buying heroin uh, are not sure what actually is the purity of that heroin. Absolutely. So when you're getting the prescription pill, it's regulated. You know exactly what it is. And right. once you can't access that anymore, now you're, you're taking a much bigger gamble with, with what it is you're actually injecting to meet that addictive need. I think another thing that hurts, that hurts people, too, from an overdose perspective, which was one of the providers was, was talking about. So you get folks who, who stop, right? It, however they do it, whether it's Suboxone treatment, cult or whatever, they, 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 they stop and they have a, they have a period of, of, of sobriety. And then they, they use again and they use at the same level that they were using when they had a tolerance. And that gets a little risky for people as well. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, we all know how much stigma hurts our efforts. Is there any kind of awareness campaign or other effort going on to change people's attitudes and beliefs about substance abuse and mental health? We really need to transform to a culture where, helps, where help seeking behavior and help giving behavior are the norm among the general population. I think that's a great, great point and a good question. That's public health. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's approaching it that way through education, through awareness through conversations, you know, normalizing it and, and changing the discussion and moving away from, you know, the blaming business that we're doing. It, they are diseases, they're very powerful diseases that have profound effects on people's lives. Public health has shown that it, that's able to sort of turn the way society thinks about things around, so. And public health really uses what we call an ecological model. And the ecological model says that there has to be integration between levels. So you work at the individual level, you work at the interpersonal level, you work at the organizational level, school and occupations, you work in communities, and then it's got to at some point move policymakers. And it can work in one direction or the other. So for education, for awareness, for actual shifting of attitudes and beliefs that might lead to changes in policy and funding, Public health argues that you have to be working at all these levels. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a lot of our efforts may get isolated to one level versus another, and our efforts and energy don't travel. And public health would argue you need to look at this in a more ecological or generalized fashion so that there's commitment from all the different levels that might influence ultimately helping that individual. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for today. So thank you both very much for your presentations and answering all of the questions. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us today. Please remember to fill out your evaluations online. Your feedback is always helpful to the development of our programs and continuing education credits are available. To obtain nurse continuing education hours, CME, and CHES credits, learners must visit www.phlive.org and complete an evaluation and the post-test for today's offering. Additional information on upcoming webcasts and relevant public health topics can also be found on our Facebook page. Don't forget to like us on Facebook to stay up to date. This webcast will be available on demand on our website within two weeks of today's show. Please join us for our next webcast, Breastfeeding Grand Rounds, on August 7th. I'm Rachel Breidster. Thank you for joining us on Public Health Live.